Father, we are thankful for your goodness, for the blessings of your mercy and your presence and the praises of your people. God, we just pray that you're with us this evening and the service. Let us feel you draw closer than a friend and, and bless this offering according to your riches and glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated as we go through just a couple of announcements. We don't have a super busy week coming up. We are this Saturday going to have a cleaning day. Um, usually I don't do that. I just there's me a time that I'm going to come clean, but y'all fuss at me for that. So I'm going to be here Saturday for cleaning if you want to join. Um, we're going to mop. We're going to, you know, do the window seals, do the windows in and out. And just, it needs a good scrubbing. So that's what we're going to do. So if you want to come help do that, we're going to do it Saturday um, at 4. And then just a reminder, it's two weeks away for our five-year anniversary. We want everybody to come. There'll be food. There'll be fellowship. We'll celebrate the goodness of God and, and the things he's doing and we'll celebrate the things he's going to do that we just haven't seen yet. Um, so we encourage you to join us for that. It'll be a good time and I think we're going to be doing it out at um, the pavilion near Peyton Hall at the fairgrounds. So remember two weeks from today at four o'clock we'll be out there celebrating five years. Um, and that's it on the slides but I didn't make a slide for women's workout. We're doing that every Thursday at five o'clock right here and it's completely free. So you're invited to come join us for that. We work out and we get hot and then we make fun of each other. So it's a great time. <laughs> oh man. I just had to throw that paper in the podium and I completely missed and just threw it at the floor. <laughs> That's it for our announcements. Uh, the kids can go and So how's your love life? <laughs> not not your love life with your spouse or your kids or your dogs. Mine's pretty good on all those fronts. But your love life um, with God. We're going to take a, a moment because there's, there's racial tensions in the world. There's issues with the LGBT community. There's issues with politics. There's, I mean, every time we turn around, there's another reason that things are going wrong. There's abuse of authority, both in the church and in the secular world. And and, and we make it difficult. We make all of these rules and all of these programs and all of these, all this red tape, we make it difficult. And the truth is, whatever our stance is, whatever our response is, it should just be love. That easy. There shouldn't be a criteria to check off as to whether or not you're going to help somebody. There shouldn't be a criteria to check off as to whether or not somebody can join you. Because it's just supposed to be love. It's supposed to be easy. We cannot be content to simply bask in the love that God has for us and not give it away. We can't just be content to know that we've got God's love. Because whether whether we help somebody or not, God loves us. Whether we give or not, God loves us. Whether It doesn't matter what we're going to do. God sees us and he loves us. And that's a beautiful thing. But a lot of times, because it gets tricky and because there are politics, we just kind of step back and we let somebody else handle that and we just bask that God loves us. Well, there's times when that's that's okay. But for the most part, he's, his love for us should... Um, should inspire, should put in us a desire to love others the same way that we are being loved. We're given love so that it can be returned. Have you ever, I'm sure you have, imagine a time when you loved someone, and I'm not even talking about a romantic love, it can be a romantic love, but when you have loved someone and it's not reciprocated. When you have put everything you have into a relationship and you have prayed over that relationship and you have um, given to that relationship your time, your money, or, or whatever, you've, you've done everything you can in that relationship and that person just does not want a relationship with you. <laughs> It's not reciprocated. They don't do the same things for you. They don't say the same things to you. They don't defend you behind your back. It's not reciprocated. It's devastating to love something and have it not return that love. It's horrible. And so I can't imagine how God feels when he loves us so completely and we're hesitant to give it back. We're hesitant. We just hold on to it. That, that he would feel um, disappointed, I guess. He's not, like I said, he's not sending anybody to hell over it, but I can only imagine how amazing he feels when it's freely reciprocated and we don't when we love God we love others every time you love someone besides yourself you're loving God essentially God is feeling the love that you're giving because that's our mission we're supposed to love others that's the whole idea and so when we do that we're doing the very thing that God created us for our scripture verse tonight is in Mark 12 verse 28 through 31 um I'll just read one of the scribes, that this is Jesus, and he's answering questions of everybody, and he's doing a really good job answering everybody's questions. And so one of the scribes decides they're going to trip him up. They see him answering all these questions wisely, and they're like, we'll get him on this one. <laughs> so one of the scribes approached, and when he heard them debating and saw that Jesus answered well, he asked, which command is the most important of all? 
Jesus answered, the most important is, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. So the first thing Jesus says, um, the first thing we see is a great question. The answer was simple. Jesus just said love. <laughs> Essentially, but the question was not the question was not simple. The question that he posed to Jesus was not one that was meant to just have a one-word answer or a, a rhetorical question by any means. Um, oftentimes when we ask ourselves if we're loving, the question isn't simple because we're doubting. Um, when we look up and we say, how would God want me to do? And we know we haven't. We begin to make reasons or justifications as to why we haven't responded in love or why we haven't been drawn by love. And we make it a very complicated question to our lives. At this time, there were 613 commandments to the Jewish law. So the, the scribe comes up and he's like, Jesus, out of 613, which one is the most important? It was a very complicated question because he wanted Jesus to take his time and think about all of these. He wanted Jesus to maybe forget one. He wanted Jesus to maybe put the wrong one on the most important. Asking Jesus was meant to give focus on works instead of him. He wanted Jesus to focus on the law. He wanted Jesus to focus on those 613 commandments. When all Jesus was saying was, look at me. You know, God is love. It doesn't get any simpler. Watch me. It's not complicated. It's not hard. There's no ritual. There's no rule. There's no guideline. There's no criteria you have to fulfill to be able to be like me. It's just love. So the scribe asked this very difficult question, and Jesus is like, we're not going to look at the law. That's not the point of why I'm here. And that's because our works alone do not reflect true love. At this point, they were following the law. At this point, they were under law. And law was very much about works. You had to sacrifice, and you had to give a tenth of everything you had, and you had to go to the temple, and you could say that God didn't work, and you had to, you know, purify yourself. And women couldn't go certain places during certain times of the month, and women couldn't do certain things. And the, there were rules about what you could eat, and where you could sleep, and when you could take a break, and when you could work. And everything was about what you were doing to get God to love you. And Jesus was saying, he already does. You're just supposed to be loving him and others. He already does. You don't have to work anymore for that. And so the harder you work, oftentimes, the less you love. Because you're caught up in what you're doing and you're missing the big picture. You're distracted. It's a good thing, but it doesn't mean it's the thing God wants you to do. You're, you're getting caught up on your works. So then Jesus gives a great answer. And it's actually two answers in one. Um, and he does it because the first answer will automatically cause the second answer to occur. We complicate things, but Jesus simplifies it very quickly in this. He fulfilled the law so that we can have real relationship with him instead of forced religion. He didn't want people to gather in a building and tell each other that they were holy. He didn't want people to gather in the streets and tell each other they weren't holy. He didn't want finger pointing and shame and guilt. He didn't want difficulty. He didn't want someone restricted to access to him because of something they had done or something they said. He wanted them to know the doors. That's why the veil was torn. No more is there separation here. And he didn't want people to have to do that. So he, he says, we're not going to do forced religion anymore. That doesn't get anybody anywhere. Because the truth is, and you see it with kids a lot of times, they're when you parent your kid and all you tell them about a thing, let's say drugs. Don't do drugs, don't do drugs, I'll kill you if I see you with a cigarette, I'll, I'll beat you if I catch you with dope, whatever your, your thing is. And your kid doesn't do drugs while they're under your roof. They move out and go to college and they try every drug under the sun. <laughs> because your parenting said, don't do this because a punishment will follow. And that's what the law was doing. It was don't do this because then you're going to have to pay for it. There's punishment. There's condemnation with that. And then the grace movement comes along. Jesus comes along and he says, don't do that because it will hurt you. Let me protect you from that and offer you this instead. So if you look at your kid and you say, yeah, there's going to be consequences because you're going to get sick as a dog if you do drugs. If you get drunk, you don't feel good the next morning. It's not healthy. Let me show you a better way to spend your time. You, there's a difference between a kid obeying out of fear, obeying because they don't want the punishment, and obeying because they respect and love their parent. If they're obeying the rules because they respect and love their parent, they'll always obey the rules whether they're under your roof or not. 
But if they're obeying just because they're afraid of getting punished, once they're in the clear, <laughs> they're going to start experimenting. They're going to start figuring out what's out there. They're going to want to figure out why that thing was so bad. Jesus was saying, we're no longer under the law where you're going to want to do these things once you think I'm not looking. Or that you're going to do them and know you can fix it by repenting later. I'm going to offer you a life that doesn't even tempt you to do those things. You're not even going to want to do those things. Because what I've got is so much better. And that's what we're seeing happen when he says, let's get rid of this forced religion and pursue a real relationship. Jesus just simplifies it real simple that way. Now he starts out this saying, the one true God. He reminds them that God alone will work in this formula. You can't add anything to this or take anything away to make it work. You can't say, God, I love you, and then on Wednesday worship the golden calf. You know? For us, it can't be, God, I love you, but only on Sundays and Wednesdays. The rest of the week is mine. I'll, I'll do what I want. I'll repent and stuff when I go to bed at night. That's, that's not love. He's like, God has to be the focus. Other translations um, actually said, Lord, our God is Lord alone. It's a better translation of, than, what we, than the one that we read so it's saying there's no room for idols, there's no room for distraction, there's no room for an afterthought. You don't love God because you have nothing else to do. You don't love God, and love is an action word, it's more than just saying it, it's doing it. And so if you value something over loving other people, then that thing becomes what has your attention, not God. And you're not keeping him center focus number one, you know, the head of, the, the head of your life. And so when God is in your life, and the one that you're seeking after, that greatest commandment, that first one, love God with everything you have, it's easier to fulfill. Because you are in relationship. It is easier for me to do a favor for somebody I love than for a stranger. Why? Because I'm in relationship with that person. I'm going to be spending time with that person. I'm going to get to see them enjoy the gift I've given them. Right? So it's easier just naturally when you have a relationship and you know who you're working with. And then Jesus gives four dimensions of love for God. The first is your heart. It's like, love the Lord your God with all your heart. The second is the soul, then the mind, and then strength. He focuses on the heart because this is the most comprehensive of them. This is the center of your being. This is what you value. This is what you nourish. This is what you spend time with. Scripture says, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. That's where God's at. That's where all of the good stuff is. That's where you grow. That's where you mature. And Jesus is saying every part of you has to mature by loving God. You're not going to get mature. You're not going to grow. You're not going to be encompassed with God's love if he's not number one. You have to love him with all of you. The second one on soul refers to your emotional life. Because God is constant and emotions are not. You might not feel like going to church. But you go to church because you love the Lord. Because you know that feeling can fade. I know a lot of times... Um, there's things I don't really want to do, like clean the house or do the laundry. But once I get up and start doing them, I don't mind it. I'm not mad about it. I just, matter of fact, I feel a little bit accomplished. <laughs> feel like I got something done. I don't feel like such a slob, you know? And so it's the same thing. God's saying the way you feel right now is not constant, but I am. I'm here while you feel like that. And if you do it anyway, I'm here and it's going to be beautiful. It's going to bless you. It's going to grow you. It's not about how you feel. It's about knowing God is constant. And there's nothing that changes in that relationship. He says, to love him with all of your mind. This is your intellect. This is how you know God. It's hard to worship somebody you don't know. How do you know God? You study the word. You study the scriptures. You meditate. You spend time having conversations with him. You have quality time with God. It's very hard to know somebody you don't spend any time with. I couldn't tell you who, what a stranger's favorite color is. I should know somebody's favorite color that I've spent time with. I might see something and think, that reminds me of so-and-so. I'm not going to say that about a stranger. I don't know them. If you aren't spending time with God, then that's not all of your mind because you're filling your mind with other thoughts. You're filling your mind with books or TV or movies or whatever, I don't know, horoscopes, whatever your hobby might be that, that takes away from time to get to know God. And then the last thing he says, love the Lord your God with all your strength. These are your physical efforts. Scripture says faith without works is dead. It's pointless to love him if you're not going to do it. It's pointless to tell everybody, I'm a Christian, God loves me, God loves you, I'm saved, you can be saved, it's a free gift, and that's all you ever do. You post on Facebook all your favorite Bible verses, but that's all you ever do. You don't go physically and feed the poor. You don't go physically and attend church on a regular basis so you can be plugged into needs of the community. You don't physically.
typically go and pray for people and ask for prayer requests and pray to their faith so they know that you care. When you don't do anything, you're not loving God with all your strength. You could be doing more. There's always something you could be doing. And so to love God completely, you have to do it heart, soul, mind, and strength. Every part of you is going to display that. And then he says, loving your neighbor is evidence of that transforming love. When you love God like that, you're going to love your neighbor as yourself. It's just natural. That's what happens. Because when you love God, God's love is then able to be deposited in you and flow out of you. It'll just naturally happen. That's how it works. This is where we see, um, when we, we talk about grace a lot because we say uh, in the loving your neighbor aspect, this is where we see behavior modification versus heart transformation. You go to church your whole life and the church tell you, don't do that, don't do that, don't say that, don't talk about that, don't dance like that, don't go there. Or you can have a church that says, do whatever you want so long as you love God first. Because I believe if you love God first, he will transform you. And no amount, no amount of me saying don't do that is going to make you not do that. <laughs> I was told my whole life, never cuss. Did I cuss? Yep. I was told my whole life, you have to give that 10% every service. Did I do that? Yep. To the point that I would overdraw the bank because I had to give that 10%. That was the rule. Or I wouldn't be allowed to act and serve in church. Well, did I get blessed through that? Absolutely not. Because I didn't give it with a cheerful heart. I knew I was overdrawing my bank. <laughs> I didn't do it with good intentions. And I was giving from my lack. God never, never asks us to give from our lack. That's not the point. So you can modify somebody's behavior and you can rule over somebody to the point that they will give from their lack. But if there's no heart transformation, all of that is useless. That did not foster a relationship with God. That did not foster me being able to trust him with my finances. I don't have enough to give you, and I still have to give it to you anyway. I don't trust you with my finances. Lord, you're not blessing me. Well, I wasn't giving out of a good heart. I wasn't giving because I loved God. I was giving out of obedience. I was giving because I was told to, that that was the rule, and that God would bless me whether I did it or not, that I was cursing, and that I was stealing from God if I didn't give it. I don't know about you, but if there's anybody that cannot be stolen from, it's God. You know, they love using that scripture out of Malachi. You're stealing from God if you take from the storehouse. Well, guess what? We don't have storehouses anymore. Jesus, it specifically says in scripture, Jesus took the curse. So if I don't give another penny, I ain't stealing nothing. Now, scripture does say to excel in the grace of giving. Should I be giving? You better believe it. Should I be giving graciously? You better believe it. But if I put God first and I have loved God completely, I'm going to give because I've been transformed. Behavior modification does not create a relationship. Heart transformation creates a relationship. And we don't get people there through guilt. We get people there by showing them what's better. We get people there by showing them that we believe it's better. By doing things. By them seeing us actively believing that in our lives. And then you have the argument of, well, who's your neighbor? Okay, I'm supposed to love my neighbor, but am I supposed to, to love the skinhead in the, in the you know, apartment building out back? Yep. <laughs> yeah. And, it, and, and saying I love them is not loving them. Providing them a meal is loving them. Talking to them like they're a human being is loving them. Inviting them to church is loving them. Saying I love them but... Nope, that's not loving your neighbor because God never said but. Up into the life of his only son, God never said but. And we do. Loving your neighbor, Jesus clearly clar uh, clarifies in Luke 10. He talks about... Um, he tells the disciples the story about the, the man who's set upon by robbers and he's left on the side of the road and the priest comes by and the scribes and he tells everybody that goes by and, and it's the Samaritan that saves him. It's the Samaritan that pays the innkeeper. And Jesus says to them, which of these men were the neighbor? And they're all like, well, it was the Samaritan, which for them was a bad guy just because they were Samaritans. A lot of racial tension. Um, and they admitted it was the Samaritan. Why? He was the one that, that actively loved that man. He didn't say, I'm going to pray for you and left him on the side of the road. He didn't walk on the other side and pretend he didn't know what was going on. Well, that's what one of them did. They went to the other side and looked away. How many times do we pretend we don't know what's going on just so that we don't have to be in a sticky situation, an uncomfortable moment, so that if others see it, we don't have to justify it? Jesus said, your neighbor is the one that needs mercy. It's the one that needs help. It's the one least likely for you to want to help. 
Sometimes it's the one you don't want to. You think, Lord, I have helped them a hundred times and I'm not doing it again. <laughs> Sometimes Jesus is like, that's your neighbor though. And I've helped you a hundred times and I would do it a hundred more. You're supposed to be just like me. You're supposed to be loving your neighbor just like me. The love of God encompasses our whole being. It infiltrates us and it multiplies. It becomes part of our speech. It becomes part of our natural nature. That's why... The closer we get to God, I don't think we have to tell people what they can and can't do because the Holy Spirit takes care of that. You know, the Holy Spirit convicts us. The Holy Spirit kind of guides us. We kind of get a pang and think, oh, I shouldn't have done that. We, we get a notice. We know, inevitably we know, if we've done something that's not quite what God's goal was for that situation or for that opportunity, we know. And the beautiful thing is, we know we get to try again. That nobody's going to, you know, make us go bathe in a pool and nobody's going to make us slaughter a lamb and nobody's going to... Make us wait out of the city for seven days till we're clean again. Nobody's going to do anything. We just get to try again. And every time we love someone, it multiplies. It's like you don't, just because I give to somebody, whatever it is, my time, my emotions, a meal, whatever it may be, it doesn't mean I do without because God multiplies his love. If God wants you to love somebody, he's going to make sure you have the means to do so in whatever measure that is. And it may just be a kind word. Some people are like, I don't know what to say. Let God tell you. He will. If the point is to love people, God will make sure you can do that. Um, Because his love multiplies. His love changes you and it saves you. And then love for others flows out from the love of God. It's a byproduct. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Love is a fruit of the Spirit. God is love. And the scripture says, our fruit is love. A mature Christian loves. And so if you say, well, how should I feel about the... The, the, the gay marriage laws. It doesn't matter how you feel. It matters because God's love is constant. And God didn't say, I love some of you. God didn't say, if you mess up, I don't want you. God said, you're going to mess up so much, I'm going to kill my own kid to get you back. That's what I'm going to do. And we're looking at somebody and saying, because you love somebody, I don't want anything to do with you. God said, I will allow them to murder my son so that I can love you. And we allow so many petty things stop us from loving people. You see, it's not about the laws. It's not about the racial tensions. It's not about what's good and what's right and making different rules and changing society. It's literally, what's the number one rule? What's the number one law? Love every time. I'm going to love you and I don't care who you love. I don't care if you got drunk. I don't care if you got high. I don't care if, if you're mean. I don't care if you're sullen. I don't care if you're Christian. I don't care if you're Muslim. I don't care if you came from Iraq. I don't care if you came from South Africa. I am going to love you because that's what God said to do. And of all the things God has said for mankind to do for all of time, love is by far the easiest. I don't know about you, but I could not have lived in Mosaic times and done all 613 of those commandments. I could not have done it. I would have been a harlot on the outside of the streets. I would not have survived. The Lord knew that I should be on earth at this time, such as this, because I would not have survived. And that it stoned me to death. There have been, it's been so difficult to be a perfect Christian in history. To be at a time and under a covenant that says, get off of all of the junk don't worry about what people are thinking. Don't worry about what people are saying. One time, and I don't remember exactly what the context of our conversation was, though, but I was talking to Hope, and we were talking about, you know, what church rules are and what church rules should be and, and if they should be broad in general or if you have to be really specific and, and would that affect us with the law and with lawsuits, and we were just kind of battling back and forth. And she made a comment that stuck with me for the rest of my life, and she said, I just don't think there's ever going to be a day that we go to heaven and God says, oh, you loved too much. You don't get to come in. She said, if I, if we're wrong about loving gay people, if we're wrong about telling gay people, come to Living Grace, we're going to love you and serve with you. If we're wrong about that, and we go to heaven, I don't think God's going to look at me and go, you love those people, how dare you go to hell. He may say, you missed the mark a little bit, but you love my people. You love the ones that needed me the most. If I'm wrong, I would rather be wrong in love than wrong without it. I would rather be wrong in love than wrong without it any day of the week. I'm not saying we have it all figured out. I'm not saying we have to. I'm just saying we have to love and let the rest of the chips fall where they may. It's not up to us. God never said you have to decide who gets to heaven. God never said you have to decide who's holy. You have to decide who's right. God never said you have to point out someone's sin. 
God never said you have to confess sin to a man and have him give you a 10 step criteria on how to get holy again. God never said any of that. And churches are famous for you sin, so come to my counseling session and I'll decide when you're ready to get back into the church. That's insane. God never said that. He tore the veil so there'd be no separation ever again, knowing we were going to mess up. <laughs> knowing we were, that's the whole reason. If we weren't going to mess up, there was no point of the crucifixion. And he's not that heartless of a God that he would do that without a purpose, without a big purpose. When we get challenged by what we give and what we do, love for others is an expression of us applying the two greatest answers that were ever given. Anytime you have a question about what would God do, what would Jesus do, we're good about going, oh, look at the Ten Commandments. We're good about saying, I'll pray for you. We're good about doing those things. But when we say, what would Jesus do, he would love. He would love God first completely with everything in him. And then he would love everybody else. He loved the leper. He loved the tax collector. The sons of Zebedee who had terrible tempers, he loved them. And he didn't just say it, he did it. So if you have a doubt, if you have a question, just ask, is this love? And it's going to be a loaded question sometimes because if you're like me, you're going to be like, nope. There's plenty of times I'm like, that's not love. I'm not acting in love. I'm not living in love. I'm not doing it. I should be, but I'm not. It's a loaded question, but it's one we should ask ourselves on a daily basis to keep ourselves on the right track, to remind ourselves that it's literally not about us and all the petty ways we think is going to make life easier for us here on earth. It's not about here. It's about eternity. It's about where we spend tomorrow. It's about who we spend tomorrow with. And I certainly want God to say, man, you loved as good as anybody. You were a little wonky sometimes, but people knew you loved. There's an old song, and I used to sing it years ago, and the title of it was just She Loved. And, 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 and the song talks about if, if I die, I want him to say I'm an honorable wife. I want him to say I was a good mom, that I sacrificed for my kids. She said that more than anything, if anybody says, who was she, what was she like, I want people to say she loved more than anything else. She loved. That's the legacy I want to leave. And if we love God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, our soul, and our strength, if we love each other and our neighbors, we all will leave the legacy of people saying she loved. That simple. Everything, that tiny four-letter word encompasses. It seems like too small a word to be used to describe everything that it is. There should be some big old long word that describes it. But that's the simplicity of God. We make it complicated. And it's just so simple. Father, I pray that you continue to guide us in simplicity. Lord, as we look for complicated answers, as we look for validation and justification for what we do, for what we say, for what we don't do, or say, God, I pray that we're pointed back to the common greatest command that was ever given, and that was just to love you and love each other. Lord, let us see the ease of that. Let us embrace the ease of that. Let us question ourselves and, and challenge ourselves, Lord, to be transformed by a love that is forgiving, a love that is saving, a love that multiplies, Lord, and just begins to transform not just our lives, but the lives around us. We're so thankful for that abundant love. We're thankful for that free gift of love that overflows out of you, Lord, every second of every day to us that is unwarranted, undeserved, but God given freely just the same. Lord, let us learn from you. Let us learn from Jesus what that love is, what that pure love looks like. Let us walk away from forced religion and into real relationship with the Jesus who died to save us, with the love that, that couldn't be measured. Lord, we're thankful for all of those things. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.